بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله Today inshallah brothers and sisters I want to talk about the topic of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's knowledge and that he is with us wherever we are and then I'm going to transition into our dua dua and supplications and how to understand that Allah is with us and he knows everything and how we can rely on him and have tawakkul and not to worry about the calamities and the ups and downs of the world that come to us and how to deal with them insha'Allah. It's going to be a very nice and interesting journey tonight insha'Allah ta'ala. My brothers and sisters, when one ponders on the characteristics and the lives of the prophets, we find that all of them went through calamities and tests and trials, as you know. Yusuf alayhi salam, when he sees the dream, and he knows that his father tells him that your brothers are going to plot against you, and that his family may abandon him, and he might go through domestic violence. He tells the dream to his father, and his father himself, Yaqub alayhi salam, does not know what his son's fate is. And he is a messenger of Allah, Yaqub alayhi salam, Jacob, Yaqub alayhi salam. He says to him, son, don't tell your dream to your brothers, otherwise they will plot a terrible plot against you. And in the end of the verse, Yaqub alayhi salam says to his son, Inna rabbaka alimun hakim. Your Lord is ever so knowing and he is ever so wise. Brothers and sisters, when we recite this verse, we pass it very quickly. But every word that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala states in the Quran has a tremendous and deep meaning. That is why pondering on the Quran is extremely crucial. And when we read it again and again, the meaning starts to mean even deeper when we concentrate. He says three words or four words, Inna rabbaka alimun hakim. In other words, O Yusuf, my son, I don't know what's the fate. I don't know what's in store for you. I don't know how to interpret this dream for you. But this is something that I do know. Your Lord who is your caretaker and your guardian. He is ever so knowing. He knows the past, the present and the future. He knows what is in store for you. Hakim, meaning that he is wise. In Arabic, when you say hikmah, it means to know where everything belongs. Allah knows where to put things in their right place. In other words, Yaqub is telling his son, son, right now you don't know, but there is no, no need to worry or to make conclusions. You may go through hardships, but always remember that Allah is with you all the way. He knows exactly what's going to happen. And if you rely on him truly, he will know where to place everything in the right place. Your mission is to be patient. Do the right thing and stay with Allah and don't give up. And bi ta'ala, by the will of Allah, things will unfold. No calamity stays forever, brothers and sisters, and no luxury or joy stays forever. We are here for a trial and a test. There are happy times and bad times. Your duty, don't abandon Allah. Allah will never abandon you. But you have to be patient. Don't be hasty. Don't rush things. Don't say, I made dua. Why hasn't Allah accepted my dua? This is disrespect to Allah. And this is not knowing who Allah truly is. When we see Zakaria alayhi salam wanting a child. And he says, Oh my Lord, walam akum bi du'aika rabbi shakiyya. My Lord, I have never been unblessed in my supplication to thee. Meaning, that Zakaria is saying, oh, you have never failed me, my Lord, and I have never assumed the wrong of you, and I will never assume wrong of you even. Habli, gift me with a righteous child. Even the way they used to ask Allah was in absolute humbleness, with absolute respect, and with absolute piety and reliance on him, subhana. When Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam's wife Khadij radiallahu anha died, when his father and mother died, when he was raised as an orphan, when his uncle who protected him died, when all the Muslims had migrated from Mecca to Medina and he was left homeless, they were going to assassinate him. And he only had Abu Bakr anhu with him. And he ran from Mecca and, and hid very, 
very carefully while people were after him and his, he had, they had a bounty on his head sallallahu alayhi wa sallam he was calm and he said to and Abu Bakr was a little bit nervous and when they were in the cave you all know the story in Sahih al-Bukhari he says to Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu ma baluka bithnayni allahu thalithuhuma oh Abu Bakr what would you think of two people Allah is their third Allah says this in the Quran when those two were in the cave, when he said to his companion, meaning Muhammad وسلم, said to Abu Bakr anhu, do not be saddened and don't grieve, Allah is with us. Your mission, stick by what is right by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Keep doing what you can, even if you go through hardships and sicknesses and hardships. When he saw Ammar ibn Yasir radiallahu anhu, when he was captured, by the disbelievers of Mecca, he was tied and he was made to watch his own father and mother be killed in front of him. And they died. He ran to the Prophet ﷺ afterwards when they released him. And he said, Ya Ammar, don't, don't lose yourself. Your father and mother are the first martyrs and they are the first of paradise among, them, among the Muslims. And he said, O oh, Rasulullah, it's not that. I mentioned you in a bad way. And Rasul ﷺ said to him, if they capture you again, does your heart agree with it? He says, La wallahi ya Rasulullah. He said, if they capture you again and they did the same thing, you repeat the same thing to them. Say, swear at me, not a problem. Because in that case, it's a matter of life and death. The point, brothers and sisters, is this. There are people who will be captured. There are people who will be going through hardships. And you might think to yourself, well, how come Allah doesn't accept the dua for them when he says that he's always there with them? And how come he accept the dua for the Prophet ﷺ saying that Allah is with us? The answer, brothers and sisters, is this. We don't know everything. Allah knows everything and everything is accounted for. You are in a time of trial. Be patient with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and never assume wrong. Wherever you are, it's the place you have to be. Make it right and do the right thing within the way Allah created you. Whether he created you a boy or a girl, a male or a female, in the family that you were born with, the parents that you have, the children that you have, the relatives that you have. Don't sit there complaining night and day and getting angry and cutting off your ties and being bad to your parents and saying, why did God give me these parents? Or your children, why did God give me this son or this daughter who gives me headache or heartache? Or cutting off your family ties saying how toxic they all are. Some of them can be. But what should you be doing? Listen to what Allah and His Messenger commanded you and do within your power. Don't lose your heart and grow into harsh heartedness. Remember, everything is a trial and a test. And you are in the right place and Allah knows that nothing befalls you except that He knows you are able to pass it. But it is you or me who will block the way. Always remember, Inna Allah alimun. What is it that Yaqub said to his son? I told you there are four words. Inna Allah alimun hakim. And alimun means what? <coughs> he knows everything. There is ilm which means knowledge. And there is alim. Even the way we recite it, we extend it. Which means deep and far knowledge. Beyond your capacity. Hakim. Everything he knows where to place it in the right place. Hakim. Isn't that correct? Always remember those. Inna Allah alimun hakim. Even Yaqub salam, every time he planned, and pl he planned to try and save his son, nothing went his way. Yaqub salam. Every time he planned, did it go his way? No. He told his sons, I don't want to send him out with you. It backfired. He told his sons, the wolf will eat him. It backfired. They used that against him. They used his, they weren't thinking of using the wolf as a lie. He gave them that idea. So he was planning and it backfired. He tried not to lose his son. He lost him. He tried to uh, get him back. He couldn't. And even afterwards, so brothers and sisters, Inna Allah alimun. Hakim, Go like that in all your life, insha'Allah ta'ala, and do not give in. Brothers and sisters, let us talk then about Allah, how he, he is alim and hakim. From the Qur'an, we will go through some verses, insha'Allah, that are deep, that we always recite in our salat and at home. And I advise you, brothers and sisters, don't ever leave the Qur'an. Every day recite it. Every day recite from it. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says... <clears throat> أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم قل لو كان البحر مدادا لكلمات ربي لنفد البحر قبل أن تنفد 
الْأَرْضَ كَلِمَاتُ رَبِّي قَبْلَ أَنْ تَنْفَدَ كَلِمَاتُ رَبِّي وَلَوْ جِئْنَا بِمِثْلِهِ مَدَدًا Allah says in Surah Al-Kahf, towards the end, Say, O Muhammad, in brackets, say, If the entire ocean of the earth was turned into ink to write the words of your Lord and all his knowledge, the entire ocean would dry out and become depleted and disappear before your, your Lord's words would run out. Even if, Allah says, even if we brought another set of oceans like them and made them into ink again to write the words of your Lord, they will perish and be gone again before your Lord's word, wo wo words will perish. Allahu Akbar, brothers and sisters. Allah says in another verse, وَلَوْ أَنَّ مَا فِي الْأَرْضِ مِنْ شَجَرَةٍ أَقْلَامٌ وَالْبَحْرُ يَمُدُّهُ والبحر يمده من بعده سبعة أبحر ما نفدت كلمات الله إن الله عزيز حكيم Allah says and if all the trees on earth were pens all the trees on earth were what? pens and the ocean were ink, with seven oceans behind it to add and to supply over and over. Yet the words of your Lord will not be exhausted in the writing, for Allah is exalted in power, full of wisdom. The word seven does not mean the number seven. For those of you who know Arabic, in Arabic, when you say seven, pointing to a particular counting, like an object or a number of something, then it means a number. But when you talk in this context, Allah says, even if we brought seven oceans, it does not mean literally the number seven. It means multiples upon multiples, no number. How much water is there on earth? How much water is there on earth? Have you thought about that? When Allah says, the oceans of the earth were made over and over for the ink of your Lord. There is, the scientists have told us, have discovered that there is approximately 1.26 billion trillion liters. 1.26 billion trillion liters of water on earth. And how many trees? Scientists estimate in the 21st century, there is approximately 3 trillion trees on earth. All of them interpends. 1.26 billion trillion liters of water turned into ink. And Allah says over and over again, Allah's knowledge is beyond our comprehension, brothers and sisters. Allah says in the Quran, إِنَّ اللَّهَ يَعْلَمُ غَيْبَ السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ وَاللَّهُ بَصِيرٌ بِمَا تَعْمَلُونَ Surely Allah knows every hidden thing of the heavens and the earth. Allah sees all that you do. Indeed, Allah knows the unseen of the skies and the unseen of the earth. Scientists and astronomers they say that everything we currently know, everything we see in the universe, is just 5% of everything in the universe. 5% they know. 95% we still haven't even seen and cannot understand. When Allah says, He knows that which is unseen, meaning to you, the hidden. What do we know? What have we seen? What have we seen? Yet we see people becoming arrogant and boastful. Why did God do this or do that? Allahu Akbar. Allah says, وَلَا يُحِيطُونَ بِشَيْءٍ مِّنْ عِلْمِ They can never encompass a single, even an atom's worth, something very small of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's knowledge. Yet some of us, we may say things as if we are comparing ourselves to God, to Allah. Iblis, the big Satan, why did he become a disbeliever when he refused to bow to Adam, brothers and sisters? 
Is it because he just disobeyed Allah? Well then, we would have said then that if you disobey Allah, you become a kafir. But that is not true. Disobeying Allah doesn't make you a disbeliever. We could have said that he was arrogant, meaning that he thought he's better than Adam. Well, that doesn't make you a kafir. That makes you have a quality of arrogance. But what he did was, he made him his knowledge and his own wisdom and his own thought of justice equal to God. He said to him, I am better than him. You are telling me to bow to someone I'm better to. You are not just, O God. He took away one of God's names, which is Al-Adil, the just. And he would not accept Allah's knowledge of decree, his decision, meaning that Iblis thinks he has a better decision than God. That's like when somebody reads something from the Quran where Allah says, don't do this or do that. And then I come up and I say, Astaghfirullah, my logic tells me otherwise. I'm not going to take this verse or that verse. Allah says, أَتُؤْمِنُونَ بِبَعْضِ الْكِتَابِ وَتَكْفُرُونَ بِبَعْضِ You agree or you accept some of the book and others you don't. He said this about the children of Israel at the time of Moses. The ones who became Jews later on. When they received the Torah, they picked and chose which verses they want and which ones they don't. So doing that is absolute disbelief and meaning that you're making your knowledge and your wisdom similar to God's. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says about the womb. Now we're going to go, I'm going to take you on a journey to the tiny minute things of Allah's creation and what He knows. And then we're going to go outwards into the biggest things which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created and He knows. Listen to this remarkable, amazing miracle of Allah. As Allah says in the Quran, وَكَمْ مِنْ آيَةٍ فِي السَّمَاوَاتِ يَمُرُّونَ عَلَيْهَا وَهُمْ عَنْهَا مُعْرِضُونَ Allah says, how many, how many, how many signs do they pass by in the heavens while they are neglectful of them? Some people, they say, where is the miracle of God? We say to you, brother and sister, subhanAllah, were you nothing before this and now you're here? This is a miracle from Allah. See how the rain drops from the clouds. You forgot that this is a miracle from Allah. The sun rising and setting, you forgot this is a miracle from Allah. The way Allah decorated the heavens, the sky with stars above us, big balls of gas burning billions of miles away. You forgot this is a miracle from Allah. The moon and how it rotates. And it's a clockwise, how it rotates to give us timing throughout our year. And we know our calculations and mathematics. You forgot that this is a miracle. Your own palms, your own fingerprints, your own eyes, the human being. We forgot that this is a miracle. But see what Allah says. He says, فَطَالَ عَلَيْهِمُ الْأَمَدُ فَقَصَتْ قُلُوبُهُمْ In Surah Al-Hadid, he says, Don't be like those before who received the signs and the scriptures. But as time passed, they got used to them. And their hearts became hardened to our signs. When people get used to something over and over again, we tend to forget that this is a sign from Allah. But Allah says, وَمَا يَشْحَدُ بِآيَاتِ بِآيَاتِنَا إِلَّا كُلَّ, خط كل خَتَّالٍ كَفُورٍ The only ones who become arrogant and deny our signs are the ones who are betrayers and insincere. Allah says, الله يعلم ما تحمل كل أنثى وما تغيض الأرحام وما تزداد وكل شيء عنده بمقدار. Allah says in chapter thirteen, verse eight, Allah does know what every female womb carries. By how much the wombs fall short. Of their time or number or do exceed every single thing is before his sight in a fixed precise measure brothers and sisters don't pass this verse quickly analyze every word Allah is saying I repeat it Allah does know what every female womb carries by how much the wombs fall short of their time and number, or do they exceed? Every single thing is before his sight in a fixed, precise measure. Ibn Kathir, the great Mufassir, commentator said, Allah remains fully aware of all the developments that take place in the child while in its mother's womb. 
and he watches over the decreases or increases in each of its makeup, limbs, its potentialities, capabilities, and its powers. Brothers and sisters, Allah, before you even become conceived by your mother, before the sperm and the egg even come in contact, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guides everything around it from the what's in your mother's womb to everything around it in its environment and everything else even before your parents got married even before your parents were born the hadith of the prophet ﷺ says before the creation of the heavens and the earth by 50,000 years Allah had decreed it your birth to be in that way and he had already decreed exactly what kind of genetic coding you're going to have what kind of genomes are going to exist in your DNA sequence? What kind of nucleotides are going to exist inside of your DNA? Which determine how your color is going to be, your hair, your eyes, everything, brothers and sisters. Where these cells are going to come from and the atoms that will come together with their tiny protons and electrons. And even smaller than that. In the trillions and trillions in number, without faulting even one atom, except that it makes it to the right place. Allah is all-knowing and He is wise. He places everything in its right place with His knowledge. Brothers and sisters, this is beyond what we can fathom. Wallahi, whoever thinks of it deeply. Let me give you a demonstration. Do you know how many cells are there in an average human body? Have a guess. How many cells in an average human adult body? So obviously there are some with more cells than others. 20 million. 20 million. Higher. 50. Huh? 50. 50 million. Higher. 100 million. Higher, higher, higher. Huh? 3 billion. Higher. 1 trillion. Higher. 3 trillion. Huh? Higher. 100 trillion. 100 trillion? Okay, so we're getting close. Scientists estimate and geneticists estimate 30 trillion cells in an average adult body. Stay with me now. How many cells? On average, 30 trillion cells in this little body of yours. Compared to the universe, you are, uh, you're not even a speck. Those cells are different types. You've got the red blood cells, you've got the white blood cells, you've got the liver cells, you've got the brain cells, you've got all these different types of cells. 30 trillion. Then you have another type of cells called the bacterial cells. You have 38 trillion bacterial cells. So now that's 68 trillion different types of cells in your body. You have 200 different types of cells in your body. The brain the brain by itself, Allah has created approximately 171 billion, billion, B, 171 billion cells in our brain alone. The cells of the brain, my dear brothers and sisters, well, that is very interesting. They never die. From the moment you are conceived by your mother, the, cell, the brain cells, they are formed and they continue until you die. Just the brain cells. Allah knows why. There are 86 billion neurons. Do you know what neurons are? Okay, they're tiny cells inside your brain and they connect to each other. They have electric impulses. They're the ones that make, they, they are responsible for all the functions of your brain and your nervous system. It's why you're walking, why you're talking, why you see, why you speak, why you think, why you retain memory. Everything, brothers and sisters. I want you now to add on top of that, that every day new cells are born and old cells die. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in the Quran, He knows every newborn in the earth and in yourselves and in the entire universe and everything that dies in yourselves, in the universe and in the earth. Do you know how many, just, just the cells, how many die every day 
and how many are born and Allah knows each and every single one of them their birth and their time he had written when they're going to be born and when they're going to die uh, the scientists have told us just the red blood cells just the red blood cells two to three million red blood cells are born every second how many two to three million red blood cells are born every every second one two to three million blood cells have just been born in your body and the same amount roughly dies every second why because Allah creates a balance did you remember the verse I recited before? I repeat that last part. وَكُلُّ شَيْءٍ عِنْدَهُ Who knows Arabic? بِمِقْدَارِ Every single thing is before his sight in a fixed and precise measure. So now your blood cells, your DNA, your sequences, your nucleotide, your genomes, everything is in precise measure. The white blood cells and your liver cells, each also has a lifespan. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows each one to keep you living, O servant of Allah. Brothers and sisters, let me go further now, even smaller than the blood cells. Inside our cells, there is something called DNA. Dioxyribose nucleic acid. DNA. It's what makes you up. How small is the DNA, do you think? Too small. I'll tell you a measure for those of you who know a little bit about science. They are 2.5 nanometers in diameter. Diameter. So they're actually strands. DNA is strands. They're like strings. And, they have, and they've got a thickness, like the hair. Their thickness is 2.5 nanometers in diameter. I'll tell you what that means. A human hair a human hair, you take one hair out. See how thin it is? That human hair is about 100,000 nanometers wide. How many nanometers is the DNA? Huh? 2.5 nanometers. How many diameters is your human hair? 100,000 nanometers. How small is the DNA now? How much thinner than your hair, which is 100,000 nanometers? And the DNA strand is 2.5 nanometers. طيب, I haven't stopped there. What about the tiniest stuff that's inside the DNA strand now? The nucleotides, something called the mutons, and so on. Even smaller, smaller. Even tinier particles than the mutons is called the protons, even tinier. The DNA inside each cell is longer than you are. Each DNA inside each cell, one strand, if you were to take it out, because they're like coils, it's like bringing a string and you coil it together, you coil it, coil it, coil it, and it keeps coiling, coiling, coiling upon coils. That's how the DNA looks like. If you were to take it out and make a string, and you put it from the floor upwards, it's taller than you. One DNA strand inside of a cell. That's two meters tall, one. Are you still with me, or have I lost you? There is even a tiniest, the tiniest thing ever discovered is called a quark. A quark. It is 10,000 times smaller than a proton. Proton, how small is it? It's smaller than the DNA? It's smaller than a nucleotide? Proton is one of the most smallest things. There is a quark which is 10,000 times even smaller than the proton. The DNA in every single cell stretches out. If you were to take all the DNA in all the cells of your body, every single DNA in your body that Allah had created, in every cell of your body and you stretched them all out and you tied them together how far do you think they'll reach? 
brother is saying that it will go, rotate twice around the world. Longer, longer. You, you, just one human being, this brother over here, if I took all the DNA out of his body, from every cell in his body, and put it all together and stretched it out, how far will it reach, brothers and sisters? This is the DNA which makes you the way you look. You, a human being, all your features is made of this DNA. How far has Allah put codes in there? How far can it reach? Brother is saying twice around the world, higher. To the moon, higher, higher. This is nothing. Moon's just here. That's like going from here to Coburg, from to uh, Broad Meadows. Are you ready to hear it? If you were to take out all the DNA strands from an average human being and tie it strip from one end to the other end and stretch it out, my brothers and sisters, it will equal twice the diameter of our entire solar system. Twice. You know our solar system? You know our solar system, brothers and sisters? How big is our solar system? <laughs> Tonight, I'm going to do your heading. How big is our solar system? We have to appreciate Allah's knowledge and His power, my brothers and sisters. The solar system is 18 billion kilometers wide. 18 billion kilometers wide. The DNA strands are twice that size. 36 billion kilometers long. That's our DNA. This, my dear brothers and sisters, is what Allah says. This is what makes you up. This is just the human that Allah created. He made you out of this little stuff that is larger than the entire solar system by twice, my brothers and sisters. Allah says in the Quran, وَلَقَدْ كَرَّمْنَا بَنِي آدَمْ We have truly honored the son of Adam. And then Allah says in the Quran, لَخَلْقُ السَّمَاوَاتِ أَكْبَرُ مِنْ خَلْقِ النَّاسِ The creation of the heavens, the skies, is even greater than the creation of that little human being. My brothers and sisters, let me go a little bit further for you for some, about something. Those people who don't believe in God, the atheists, ask them this question. Ask them this question. Inside of us we have a genetic code. The code that gives you your form. Which makes up the human being. Scientists and, genet and geneticists have written the codes in, a book, in books. They compiled more than 175 volumes of books. How many volumes? 175 volumes of books. They equal 262,000 densely printed pages. 262,000 densely printed pages. And every single code of the human being is written in there letter by letter. 262,000 densely printed pages, letter after letter, about the human genome. How the human's code, genetic code is. About 500 of them make us all look different. The rest of it is all the same. Now here's the question, brothers and sisters. Imagine taking just a few of those letters out from when you are inside your mother's womb, just a few, you will have a deformity. You will have a disorder. And if you take out too much, you'll die. That's why they give you an abortion. These are called genetic diseases and disorders. It's when a little bit of coding, a little bit of your, your genome or your nucleotide are, ta are taken out. Everything about you changes, subhanAllah. Everything about you changes. From here to the solar system and back twice. If you just take out a little tiny ant's size, you're no longer the same. You've got disorders and diseases. Among the diseases and alterations are things like, they've got, they, they call it cystic fibrosis, Down syndrome, albinism, others uh, like schizophrenia, autism, and some fetuses that have to be aborted. Allah says, فَتَبَارَكَ اللَّهُ أَحْسَنُ الْخَالِقِينَ Glory to, the, to Allah, the best of creators. Let's go back to the verse of the Qur'an. Did you not hear what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says? He knows what every womb carries 
and he knows which has less and which has more, meaning part of it is your genetic coding, which has less, which has more. You might say, well, scientists now can look at your DNA and they can determine what you're going to look like. We say, yes, they can. They've got 80% chance of knowing some things. And this is the knowledge Allah had given us, some of his knowledge. Allah says he gives you some of his knowledge. But can they know for certain, number one? Number two, did they know before you were even conceived? And who is the one that created the code for you? We only look at what, it, what there is, but who is the knowledgeable one, the creator, the innovator of all this? He is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now let us look at the universe. These are the small things. The universe, 1.3 million Earths fit into the sun. You know the sun? See the size of our Earth? 1.3 million Earths fit into the sun. Our solar system is 18 billion kilometers wide. And our solar system is a speck inside of the Milky Way galaxy. Our Milky Way galaxy is 100,000 light years in diameter. That's one and 18 zeros next to it. One and 18 zeros next to it. That's one billion trillion kilometers wide is, this, is the Milky Way. 400 billion stars. The smallest star, you can fit 800 Earths in it. The largest galaxy is 160 times wider than our own Milky Way. And there are two trillion galaxies like our Milky Way. In the observable universe, as far as scientists know, our universe is approximately 93 billion light years in diameter. One light year, my dear brothers and sisters, is 300,000 kilometers per second. That's 9.46 trillion kilometers per year. Our universe is expanding. And they say that the age of the universe is approximately 13.8 billion years old. Allah created and Allah ordered and decreed and willed every single atom and smaller than that and every single object and bigger than that before he created it by 50,000 years. If we just took the scientific calculations, only Allah really knows if they got it right. 14, 13.8 billion years ago and 50,000 years before that in Allah's years, Allah had made the decree. And Allah is the beginning and the end. There is nothing before Him and nothing after Him. My brothers and sisters, Allah says in the Quran, وَمَا يَعْزُبُ عَن رَبِّكَ مِن مِثْقَالِ ذَرَّةٍ فِي الْأَرْضِ وَلَا فِي السَّمَاءِ وَلَا أَصْغَرَ مِن ذَلِكَ وَلَا أَصْغَرَ مِن ذَلِكَ وَلَا in Surah Yunus verse 61, Allah says, Not even an atom's weight is hidden from your Lord on earth or in heaven, nor anything smaller than the atom or larger than the heavens, but is written in a perfect record. Even smaller than the atom. Allah has written it, where it's going to be and how it's going to be. And we sit here saying, oh Allah, oh Allah, and things happen and go wrong, we can't make sense of it, we leave Allah altogether. Allah knows, ya akhi. If He knows the atom, what's, un what's beneath it, what's happening inside, He knows. And He tells you, don't worry, I'm with you, just you, you keep going. Rely on me. Even if things go wrong, I know what's happening, have your good trust in me. No, straight away, lose the plot. My brothers and sisters, Allah says, he has the keys to the unseen. No one knows them but him. He knows all that is in the land and in the sea. No leaf, وَمَا تَسْقُطُ مِنْ وَرَقَةً No leaf falls without his knowledge. إِلَّا يَعْلَمُهَا Nor is there a single grain, وَلَا حَبَّةٍ فِي ظُلُمَاتِ وَلَا حَبَّةٍ وَمَا تَسْقُطُ مِنْ وَرَقَةٍ إِلَّا يَعْلَمُهَا وَلَا حَبَّةٍ فِي ظُلُمَاتِ الْأَرْضِ 
nor is there a single grain in the darkness of the earth or anything fresh or withered that is not written in a clear record. Brothers and sisters, every leaf that is falling is written in a clear record and every atom and cell inside that leaf is written in a clear record. Everything is destined exactly as Allah subhanahu wa had, de had destined it. Brothers and sisters, Allah is tremendous. Do not give up. Stay with Him. Wallahi, He will guide you and be patient. ta'ala. He is the one who made the Quran, wrote the Quran, uh, sorry, spoke the Quran, and He's the one who guided us. So follow His guidance. There is no other guidance but Allah's guidance, my brothers and sisters. Allah says in the Quran, أَلَا يَعْلَمُ مَنْ خَلَقَ وَهُوَ الْلَطِيفُ الْخَبِيرُ Does he who created not know what he has created? Does he who created not know what he has created? وَهُوَ الْلَطِيفُ الْخَبِيرُ He is the most kind and careful. Khabir, he knows everything of everything. Not just knows it, but understands it. Allah knows the ins and outs. Your brain, my dear brothers and sisters, is 2.5 million gigabytes of memory. How much is that compared to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's knowledge? Your eye has 324 million pixels of vision quality. Your kidney, 1.2 million filtration units. It filters 200 liters of fluid every 24 hours. When a person's kidney fails, they take him to a procedure called dialysis in the hospital. A big machine. And they put a needle inside of you and they take out blood into this machine for three or four hours while you sit there and it can only filter one liter per hour while you are sleeping dancing going coming uh, working enjoying your kidneys are filtering 24 7 200 liters of fluid every 24 hours my dear brothers and sisters and he knows exactly what it's doing your veins in your body are 40,000 kilometers is a 40,000 kilometer web if you took all the veins in your body and your arteries and everything, you extended it, there'll be 40,000 kilometers in this one human being. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala addresses us in another way. Now he can, becomes intimate with us. He says, وَلَقَدْ خَلَقْنَا الْإِنسَانَ وَنَعْلَمُ مَا تُوَسْوِسُ بِهِ نَفْسُهُ وَنَحْنُ أَقْرَبُ إِلَيْهِ مِنْ حَبْلِ الْوَرِيدِ إِذْ يَتَلَقَّى الْمُتَلَقِّيَانِ عَنِ الْيَمِينِ وَعَنِ الشِّمَالِ قَعِيدٍ ما يلفظ من قول إلا لديه رقيب عتيد. Allah says in Surah Qaf, verse 16, Surely we have created man, and we know the promptings of his heart. We know what you are whispering, Allah says, and what your heart is feeling, your emotions, your thoughts, your whispers, the feelings that you cannot even describe. Allah says, He knows it. Allah says, and we are nearer to him than his own jugular vein. Two angels on the right and left, one is ever so watching, one is ever so witnessing, are writing everything they say and do. Not a single word does he utter, except it is written. Brothers and sisters, Allah knows. Allah knows. Allah says, هو الأول والآخر. He is the beginning and the end. والظاهر والباطن. He is the manifest and the hidden at the same time. وهو بكل وهو بكل شيء عليم. He has knowledge of everything. Nothing is hidden from him, and nothing manifests beyond him. That is, when there was nothing, he was, and when there will be nothing, he will be. The best du'a is the du'a of the Prophet ﷺ when he said. Allahumma anta al-awwal, falaysa qablaka shay'. Oh Allah, you alone are the first, none is before you. Wa anta al-akhiru falaysa ba'daka shay'. And you are the last, none is after you. Wa anta al-zahiru falaysa fawqaka shay'. You alone are the exalted, none is above you. Wa anta al-batinu falaysa dunaka shay'. And you alone are the hidden. None is more hidden than you. The one who is so far yet so close. 
the one who manifests everything yet is the most hidden subhanahu wa ta'ala Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then says my dear brothers and sisters he knows all that enters the earth and all that comes forth from it and all that comes down from the heaven and all that goes up to it he is with you wherever you are Allah sees all that you do he is with you wherever you are Allah sees all that you do he is with you wherever you are every single being every ant that crawls on the rock every human by yourself Allah's hearing does not get confused Allah's seeing is never confused Allah's knowledge is never confused Allah is telling you he is with you wherever you are meaning he's watching you and at the same time meaning he can hear you you don't need to scream you don't need to shout you don't need to go anywhere specific some people say I've got to go to Mecca I've got to go to Hajj for Allah to hear me no 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 wherever you are Allah is with you your brother and sister it means that Allah hears every single one of you and every one of your dua and supplications some people I've heard say God is too busy for me he's got too many things to look after Allah says uh, 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 uh. every day Allah is doing something new and Allah says in the Quran there is no hearing that confuses with his hearing and no sight that it gets confused with him and no knowledge that gets confused with him every single one he knows exactly better than yourself my brothers and sisters Allah says in the Quran وَإِذَا سَأَلَكَ عِبَادِي عَنِّي فَإِنِّي قَرِيبٌ أُجِيبُ دَعْوَةَ الدَّاعِ إِذَا دَعَانِ فَلْيَسْتَجِيبُوا لِي وَلْيُؤْمِنُوا بِي لَعَلَّهُمْ يَرْشُدُونَ And if my servants ask you about me, I am always close. I will respond to the caller when they call to upon me. So let them continue to always call upon me. In other words, Allah does not get tired of your call and He loves it when you continue to call upon Him. And let them respond to me. And let them put their trust and, and secure their faith in me in the hope that they may reach salvation and guidance. My brothers and sisters, Allah says in the Quran, وَقَالَ رَبُّكُمْ أَدْعُونِي وَقَالَ رَبُّكُمْ أَدْعُونِي أَسْتَجِبْ لَكُمْ And your Lord has declared and called out. Your Lord says, call upon me, supplicate to me, I will respond to you. Allah also says, وَلِلَّهِ الْأَسْمَاءُ الْحُسْنَى فَادْعُوهُ بِهَا he also gives you ideas. He says, to Allah belong the most beautiful names. So mention his beautiful names when you call upon him. Allah loves you to get intimate with him in this way. And when you call upon his name, you feel closer to him, subhanahu wa ta'ala. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, يُسْتَجَابُ لِأَحَدِكُمْ مَا لَمْ يَعْجَلْ Every single one of you, your dua will be responded to, so long as you do not haste. So long as you do not what? Haste. Hurry up God, rush Him. Allah says, if you were to accept every dua that you ask in the way that you want, there will be nobody without any mercy left. Because what we want, we don't know what's good for us. Wallahu ya'lamu wa antum la ta'lamun. Allah knows and you yourselves do not know. Wa'asa an takrahu shay'an wa huwa khayrun lakum. You may hate something when it's good for you. Wa'asa an tuhibbu shay'an wa huwa sharrun lakum. You may like something when it is bad for you. Rasul Sallallahu said, يُسْتَجَابُ لِأَحَدِكُمْ مَا لَمْ يَعْجَلْ You always get responded to for your dua, so long as you do not haste, number one. فَيَقُولُ دَعَوْتُ وَدَعَوْتُ فَلَمْ أَرَهُ يُسْتَجَابُ لِي The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says, a person says, I called and I called and I made dua, but nothing was responded to me. فَيَسْتَحْسِرْ Then he starts giving up. عِنْدَ ذَلِكَ وَيَدَعُ الدُّعَاء He gets filled with despair, he gives up hope, and then he stops making dua. The hadith is in Al-Bukhari, number 6340. Brothers and sisters, why should you not haste? Because the human being is created out of haste. We see something when Allah sees the opposite. There was a great sahaba, a, a great uh, predecessor. I think it was Hassan al-Basri, Allahu alam, I may be mistaken, but one of the great predecessors among the tabi'een. He said, when I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for something and he gives it to me, I say, alhamdulillah, he gave me what I wanted. And when he doesn't give it to me, I pray longer and I make more sujood to Allah out of thankfulness because what he did for me 
was his decision and not my decision. And I know that Allah's decision is a billion times better than my decision. Has to be better for me. <laughs> because he knows what Allah decides for you is much better for you. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala even responds to the dua of the disbeliever, my dear brothers and sisters. Did you hear what I said? The mushrik, the idolater, even the atheist, Allah responds to their dua, may respond to their dua, even while they don't believe in Allah. How? And what is my evidence? Allah says in uh, Surah Luqman, verse 32, وَإِذَا غَشِيَهُمْ مَوْجٌ كَالظُّلَلِ دَعَوْا اللَّهَ مُخْلِصِينَ لَهُ الدِّينَ فَلَمَّا نَجَّاهُمْ إِلَى الْبَرِّ فَمِنْهُمْ مُقْتَصِدًا فَمِنْهُمْ مُقْتَصِدٌ وَمَا يَجْحَدُ بِآيَاتِنَا إِلَّا كُلُّ خَتَّالٍ كَفُورٍ Which means, and as soon as they are overwhelmed by waves, like mountains, they cry out to Allah alone in sincere devotion. But when He delivers them safely to shore, only some become relatively grateful, and none rejects our signs except whoever is deceitful, ungrateful. The ayah is talking in context of the disbelievers of Quraysh in Mecca, when he talks about them and then he says, and look at them. When I put them safely in the sea, and they ride on their boats and their, and their big ships and their arks, and then they see the waves start to come and a big storm hits them, people usually in the middle of the sea when they see there's no one there to save them, somehow their instinct kicks in and they say, Oh Allah, oh God, save us if you are really there. Allah says most people do that. They, they just go into this automatic dua to God. No matter who they are. And when God saves them, they betray what they said. They, in other words, Allah is saying they use, they try to use their Lord for what they want. And then they don't fulfill their promises later on. Allah says the only ones who are ungrateful are those who don't believe in God. So even the disbeliever, Allah responds to them if they call out to Allah sincerely and devoutly. My brothers and sisters, there's also a similar verse in chapter 29, verse 65, very similar to that one. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants you to be honest to Allah and to fulfill your promises with Him. And that's the only way that you will find salvation. The Prophet says, لا يزال يستجاب للعبد ما لم يدع بإثم أو قطيعة رحم. Some people they say, why is my dua not being responded to? Brothers and sisters, there are conditions to dua, and here are some of the conditions that a person must avoid when they make dua. So, be aware of them. Number one, Rasul صلى الله عليه وسلم said, a person's dua will continue to be responded to so long as he or she does not make a dua for something that is sinful and haram. Or qati'atu rahim, breaking family ties. And ma lam yasta'jil, so long as he doesn't hasten. Come on God, come on. يَقُولُ قَدْ دَعَوْتُ وَقَدْ دَعَوْتُ فَلَمْ يُسْتَجَبْ لِي It's like a person who says, well I made so much dua and nothing was responded, man. He becomes loss of hope. And then he abandons the dua altogether. The hadith is a sahih al -jamil. The Prophet ﷺ said, Every dua is responded to. Either your dua will be responded to and given to you in this life. Or maybe Allah will postpone it to the hereafter. This is when Allah knows that your dua we're asking for may not be good for you here in this world. Had He given it to you, you'll be worse off or you probably end up in hellfire for it. Or maybe you'll lose your family or maybe something bad will happen to you. This is where your trust has to kick in and say, maybe, maybe Allah has left it for me for the hereafter. وَإِمَّا أَنْ يُكَفَّرَ عَنْهُ مِنْ ذُنُوبِهِ بِقَدَرِ مَا دَعَى Or maybe Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will forgive some of their sins. Now this part, we're not sure of its authenticity, but Allah does compensate you in some way. So long as you are not, your dua is not for sin. 
أو قطيعة رحم أو connect أو disconnecting family ties أو hastening. They said, يا رسول الله, what does hastening mean? He said, a person says, I called upon my Lord, but he didn't respond. The hadith is in Muslim number 2735. Brothers and sisters, Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam forbid us from making dua on things that are haram. Here are some of the things that are haram. Such as to say, may Allah make you drink alcohol. May Allah bring zina to me. May Allah cut your family ties off. May Allah do this or that to your parents. Some people they say, may Allah not forgive you. May Allah put you into hellfire. May God never put you into paradise. Brothers and sisters, we have no right to ask for these types of dua. These are Allah's actions. However, if someone has been wronged, someone wronged you, someone took your right, you can make a dua that is enough and equal to it. It's haram to make a dua against someone when they've taken a, an insignificant right from you. Some people, subhanallah, they have, I think, too much pride. They think that their dua as if they are prophets or something or saints. When somebody upsets them with something small, immediately they go for the worst of dua against them. Somebody swore at you, somebody upset you with something. Somebody could have asked you just a question. And the shaitan comes to you and makes you assume. Why did he ask me this question? May God never forgive you. May God put you in hellfire. May God let you see the worst in your life, like what you've done. Hold on, take it easy. Subhanallah, you are not more merciful than Allah. This is haram, brothers and sisters. The scholars have spoken about this. When somebody has hurt you with something small, it's haram for you to make tremendous dua against that person. It will not be accepted. Allah is merciful. And He will not oppress anyone. But if somebody took your right, that was something serious, you have a right to say, I will not forgive you, if you want. You may say, may you get what you deserve from Allah. Alayka min Allahi ma tastahiq. To you is what you deserve from Allah. But to sit there and start making du'as upon du'as, la yakhna. No, I don't think Allah is going to accept every du'a you say. I have these sometimes people, they ask me, a lot of people ask me the same question, Wallahi, in our community. And they get scared, poor things. They say, Wallahi, someone, I made a mistake towards them and I tried to apologize. And they made a tremendous dua, may God be angry with you. He says, now I'm afraid, I don't know if my prayer is accepted, I don't know if my fasting is accepted. Subhanallah, where is the rahmah and the mercy between us, my brothers and sisters? A question, a person could ask you a question, say, look, I just want to verify, I heard something about you. They say, what? You even believe like this for me, may God do this to you and that to you. No, ya akhi, no. And they'll never forgive. This is haram, brothers and sisters. Don't use the dua in that way. Have mercy in your dua. Allah says, The way we call upon Allah, brothers and sisters, is with humbleness and with fear and with love. Is this a dua of humbleness, fear and love? No. This is a dua of ego. And self-entitlement. Allah doesn't accept these types of du'as unless you deserve it. Unless you deserve it, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala only knows. The du'a comes in three cases. Or asking, asking comes in three ways. The scholar said, if an older person like a parent asked their child to do something for them, it comes out in the form of a question, but it's really a form of command. It's just a polite way that parents ask their children. So when a parent asks their child to get them a cup of water or to help them with something, brothers and sisters, understand that Allah takes this as a command from your parents. You should respond. When you are the same age and the same type of people and you request something from your colleague or someone that is equal to you, it's called a friendly request, an equal request, a favor. But when you ask Allah, that type of dua is humbleness, where Allah is the one who makes a decision. You have no right to make a complaint if Allah doesn't give you. Some people, this is how they are with Allah. Astaghfirullah al-Azim. They make it like God owes them something. They make it like if they ask, they, astaghfirullah, shaitan comes to them and thinks that Allah betrayed them. 
And they start getting angry, they start complaining, they start shouting. They start even having fights with sheikhs, sheikhs and scholars. <laughs> you told me that God will respond, man, I don't even want this religion. Oh, I'm not going to pray. I'm gonna... Stuff that or this or that. I've heard people say that, La hawla, this is kufr, my dear sisters, be careful. Allah doesn't owe you anything. Allah says, Balillahu yamunnu alaykum an hadakum al-Islam. It is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that you owe, that He has guided you. Brothers and sisters, don't think shallow. Allah knows exactly what's going on. One person said to me, why would God want this or that? I said, listen, listen, listen. There's a day of judgment. He says, I believe in a day of judgment. I said, don't you think Allah knows exactly what you're thinking, what you're going through? He said, yes, I go, you can take it up with Allah. I'm innocent, just leave me alone. You go take it up with Allah. Allah knows exactly what you're thinking better than you. So brothers and sisters, be careful with this. Uh, causes for your dua being accepted are the following. Number one, when you start your dua with praising of Allah and sending peace and blessings onto His Messenger. So you say, Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen, wa salatu wa salamu ala nabiyyina Muhammadin wa alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. That's a dua that has more strength and more weight in being responded to. When you mean it from your heart. Number three, when you mention his names, O oh, Ar-Rahman, if you want his mercy, O oh, Al-Ghaffar, forgiver, if you want his forgiveness, O oh, Ar-Razzaq, the giver, if you want something from him, subhanahu wa ta'ala. It is best to use the Prophet's du'as if you know them. Otherwise, say it in the way you understand. It's good to make du'a in the last third of the night. It's good to make du'a in the night. It's good to make du'a when you're in sujood. It's good to make du'a between adhan and iqama. If you're at home, then when the time of salat comes, until you start praying, it's a good time to make du'a in between. Or if you're in the masjid from the adhan to the iqama, it's good to make du'a when it rains. It's good to make du'a when you're traveling. It's good to make du'a when you're fasting. While you're doing good deeds, if you're giving a charity, you're helping someone, you're moving an obstacle off the road, you're even looking after a pet, even if it's a bird, subhanAllah. Anything of good deed that Allah is pleased, make a dua in that time. Your dua is stronger when you're doing good deeds. Uh, it's good to make dua after your farad salat, so you're making a tahiyyat and everything right at the end before you say, Assalamu alaikum wa sallam, while you're in salat, make a dua. And even after salat, during Friday, the night before Friday, and so on. It's good to make dua and mention your good deeds. Let's say you remember a good deed in your past, you helped someone or you donated and nobody knows about it. When you're making dua, lift your hands up to Allah. And the hadith says that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not like to return your hands empty. So Allah loves responding to you. Mention a good deed to Allah in secret that no one knows about. Maybe one time you heard about two people who are in conflict and quarrel over money. And you came in and you assisted them to reconcile so they don't have a fight. And you secretly went to that person whom the money is owed to, and you gave him the money from your pocket, and you said, it's settled. And then you went to the other person and said, brother, alhamdulillah, it's settled. Uh, you can pay me in installments. But don't say anything. And you, this was a tremendous little good deed. And then one day you're in strife, and you say, oh Allah, if you know, Ya Allah, you know that one day I did this and I did that. Don't tell anyone about it. Keep it between you and Allah. That's why it's a good idea, the ulama said. If you've done a good deed, keep it between you and Allah. One day you may need to use it, and Allah will not let your reward go. As soon as you tell people about it, if it's not for the purpose of teaching people, then you might lose your rewards. So keep it to yourself and use it in your dua. There's a beautiful hadith in Sahih Bukhari and Muslim about three men who got stuck in a cave from the children of Israel. And these three men, when they got stuck, a storm hit them overnight and a big boulder covered the front of the cave. When they woke up, they didn't know, they couldn't get out and they were stuck. So each three of them said, let's all sit in a corner and cry to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with any good deed that you can remember. One of them, he said, Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa tells us, one of them said, oh Allah, I had old parents one time. And I used to look after my family and children. And when they are in need, I would not leave my parents to go back to them so long as my parents are in need. Yeah, and he looked, they looked, he looked after his children and everything, but his parents, he would not leave them until he did what they needed. He said one day they wanted milk. 
So I went and milked the, uh, the animal, and when I came back, they had fallen asleep. My children and family were at home, they were asleep and okay, and I would not leave their side. I would not leave until they woke up. And I did not want to wake them up because I didn't want to disturb them, my parents. And then when they awoke, I gave them the milk. Oh Allah, if you knew that I did this for your sake, then save us. So Allah made the stone move only a little bit, but it wasn't enough. Our parents, my dear brothers and sisters, how would you feel if they were to leave this world? You would wish if they would come back just for five minutes to hug them and to say how much you love them. Brothers and sisters, no matter what they are, what they've done, forgive them. But don't lose your Jannah because of them. Look at this man in Sahih Bukhari, this hadith. Allah saved him. He said, I stayed standing. I stayed in the night. I prevented myself sleep until they woke up because I didn't want to disturb them to wake up. The next he said, the next man he sat down and he said, Oh Allah, I had a cousin woman. She was pretty and I loved her. And I wanted to marry her and she refused. Uh, sorry, I loved her but I didn't marry her. And I wanted to do haram with her. He said that she used to look after uh, some children and I asked her for zina, to sleep with me in the haram. She refused for the sake of Allah. One year later, she became desperate and poor and she had nobody to look after her. So I said to her, I'll give you this money and this jewelry if you give me in return what I'm asking you for. And because she was desperate, she said, okay, to look after the orphans. He said, when I came to approach her before she took her clothes off, she said to me, I just want to say one thing, my cousin, to fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that if you want me, then only in halal. Only in halal in the right way. This was obviously before Muhammad sallallahu time. He said, something struck me in my heart and I feared Allah and said, astaghfirullah and walked away. And I kept the money and jewelry to her. Oh Allah, if you know that I did this for your sake, then save us. And the stone moved a little bit, but not enough. The third man, he said, oh Allah, I used to have a business, a farming business livestock and wheat and crops and I had people who worked for me employees one day when the harvesting and everything finished and my and my animals got fed I paid all the employees except one of them he left early before I can pay him and the man vanished for two years or so one day the man came back asking for his wage that I didn't give him oh Allah instead I felt that I owe him more than that for I had made so much profit and my livestock grew and I had more camels and more sheep and more goats and more cows. And I felt that it was necessary that I share this profit with him. So I said to him, here is all the profit from your work. Take whatever you wish from your percentage. And he took it all. Oh Allah, if you knew that I did this for your sake, then save us until the boulder moved away and they were saved. And this is what the ulama said, use your good deeds that you have a secret between you and Allah. My brothers and sisters, <clears throat> Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said that also a dua can be rejected if you are a person who constantly earns their money and their wealth from haram, always eats food from haram and drinks from haram and dresses from haram. Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, ثُمَّ ذَكَرَ الرَّجُلَ يُطِيلُ السَّفَرَ أَشْعَثَ أَغْبَر He mentioned, the hadith is in Sahih Muslim. A man will be in the desert. He is dusty. He is in strife. He is in need. He turns his hands to Allah. And he says, Oh Allah, give me, my Lord, my Lord, help me. But his food is from haram. His drink is from haram. His clothing is from haram. And he has been nourished all his life from haram. How is Allah going to accept from such a man's dua? This means, brothers and sisters, the ulama said it means that if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows that you have had a habit of asking Allah and then every time he looked after you, instead of using in the halal, you used what you asked him in haram. You used his blessings in haram and you continue to ask Allah, but you're not changing your ways. 
it comes to a point where Allah no longer gives you what you want. He no longer responds to your dua. Why would he give you when all you do is use it in haram? Is this what Allah wants you to do? To put you more into hellfire? To give you more sins and through the blessings he gives you? Allah does not accept except purity. So brothers and sisters, if you find that, look at your wealth, look at your money, look at your clothing, look at your nourishment. Where is it coming from? And repent to Allah. Maybe this is the thing between you and your dua. And there is a beautiful, I'll end it with this beautiful hadith. The hadith is in also Bukhari and Muslim about three men. One was bold. One was a leper, leprous, he had the disease in his skin, and one was blind. The first one he had sheep, the second one he had cattle, and the third one he had camels. This is how we made business from the children of Israel. The Prophet ﷺ said, One day the first man woke up and all his hair had fallen off suddenly. And he used to be a man of pride and arrogance. He thought that all this wealth is from my own work. He never gave in charity. And every time God blessed him, he used it in haram. So one day he lost all his hair. He became bold and he had beautiful hair before that. He used to, people used to come to him for some reason because of his looks. So his looks went away and suddenly his business dropped. Subhanallah. The second person, he suddenly woke up. He became leprous. He, his skin had this leprous disease. And as a result, his business became bankrupt. And the third person became blind and his business became bankrupt. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent an angel to each one of them. An angel which they could see and he said to the first person the second person the third person if Allah gives you back your blessings your hair your skin and your eyesight will you remember his blessings and use it in halal and give in charity to the poor and the needy they said we promise we promise we promise so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave them back their wealth and their looks and everything years later the angel came back to them in the form of a poor homeless man and he said to the first man who had lost his hair first, he said, please give me something of this tremendous wealth that you have in order for me to get to my family because I am a homeless man. And he said, go away from me. And he was harsh to him. All this wealth is from my own knowledge and from my own education and from my own struggles. Move away. He said, weren't you one day ever like me? Didn't you ever go through hardship like me one day? He said, never. Even if I went through it, it was just temporary. It just happens to everybody. So the angel said, oh Allah, return him to the way he was. He didn't fulfill his promise. The second person did exactly the same thing. And Allah said to him, return him to the way he was. Only the man who became blind and Allah gave him his eyesight back, he said to him, subhanallah, I was one day like you. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala blessed me when I had repented. Take whatever you wish from all my wealth. Leave it or take it. For Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is my provider. And the man said to him, I am the angel who came to you before. You have fulfilled your promise to tell you. Allah wants to say to you, enjoy your wealth and your entertainment with your wealth. And you will have both the rewards of this world and in the next. So my brothers and sisters, this is how the dua, inshallah, will be accepted. Finally, brothers and sisters, I want to say this. My brothers and sisters, never make dua against yourselves. Never make dua against your children. Never make dua against your parents and family. Never make dua against your wealth and your business. Rasul said, Asa an tuwafiqu min Allahi sa'atan yustajabu fiha dua fa yustajabu lakum. You may arrive at a time when Allah accepts your dua and He will respond to the dua exactly as you asked for it. Meaning that sometimes the dua may hit right. And you make a dua against yourself. You did it to yourself. Allah says, وَمَا ظَلَمْنَاهُمْ وَلَكِنْ أَنْكَانُوا أَنفُسَهُمْ يَظْلِمُونَ They did not, would not oppress them, they oppressed themselves. Parents, do not make dua against your children. You will regret it. Don't make dua against your parents. Don't be hasty against your friends, against anybody, brothers and sisters. Be careful. Hatta even, even the, the companion said, Ya Rasulullah, curse the disbelievers. He said, I was not sent a la'an. I was not sent a cursor. Subhanallah, curse the enemy. He says, I was not sent to curse her. Can you imagine that? And he said, don't curse your belongings. Don't curse your animals, your pets. Don't curse your, your, your objects. Don't curse. This is not what a Muslim does, my brothers and sisters. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that this lesson has benefited us in some way. Um, there was really one more thing I wanted to talk about, but you're probably tired. Can I say it or just two minutes? It's really important I see it. Brothers and sisters, look. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala may take something away from you sometimes. 
He may give you a loss. Sometimes he may think that he is punishing you. Don't think like that. Sometimes you may think God is not there for you. Don't ever think like that. I want you always to remember this one. And this particular incident helped me, brothers and sisters. You all know, alhamdulillah, what happened in my tragedy. I lost my son and my brother. Rahmatullahi alayhima. And a lot of you have lost your family members too. I know that. Some of you. And it's not easy. All our brothers and sisters around the world. I want you to remember this particular incident always in Surah Al-Kahf. You know the story of Musa and Al-Khadr. The story of Moses and the righteous man. Allahu A'lam. We, we don't know if his name was Al-Khadr, but this is what we go by. That the ulama says probably a man named Al-Khadr. And you all know quickly the story. Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Ta'ala said to Moses, Musa alayhi salam, there is a man whom we have given more wisdom and knowledge than you, which you do not know. Of the unseen. Musa alayhi salam was known for his toughness. And at the same time, he became impatient with anything that was displeasing to Allah. He wouldn't hold very quickly. E even so that the Prophet used to say Musa alayhi salam was a man of toughness. And that's what his people needed. But only for the sake of Allah. So Musa alayhi salam, he was also humble and he said, Oh my Lord, show me where he is, so I may go and learn from him, from what you have taught him. Nobody is ever too big for knowledge, brothers and sisters. And who is this man? Nobody knows who he is. And he is the messenger of Allah from Ulil Azm, Musa alayhi salam. So he went to him and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells him in the Quran, the story is long, you will find him at this particular place and so on. Anyway, in the end he meets him. And Musa alayhi salam says to him, هَلْ أَتَّبِعُكَ عَلَىٰ أَن تُعَلِّمَنِي مِمَّا عُلِّمْتَ رُشْدًا Will you allow me to follow you as my mentor, to teach me from what your Lord has taught you, from what Allah has taught you of goodness and guidance? Immediately the man says to him, <laughs> he didn't even ask who he is, he just listened to him, can I follow you to teach me from what Allah taught you? Immediately he says, لَن تَسْتَطِيعَ مَا يَا صَبْرًا You're not going to be able to be patient with me. Bang. Just like that. No ands, ifs, or buts. No introduction. No politeness. You won't be able to handle it. Musa salam got a little bit offended here, it seems, from the context of the verse. It says, sabira. You will see me, Allah willing, among the patient ones. I won't disobey anything you tell me. Like he's pleading to him. Immediately he says to him, Okay, if you follow me, don't you dare ask me a single question. Until I decide the right time when I will tell you. He said, you have my word. And so he went with him. The story goes on. There were some poor people who worked on the sea with a, with a boat. And their boat was a little bit, how are you going? They went on to it. They looked after them. They fed them. They gave them a room at the bottom of the deck. They were very generous to them. Al-Khadr goes down with Moses to the bottom of the deck. And what does he do? He takes out an axe or whatever. And he begins to break and destroy and ruin their boat. Musa alayhi salam, knowing that he is a prophet of Allah. And the one who cannot handle displeasing Allah. He says, what have you done? Laqad jitta shay'an imra. You've done something terribly outrageous. These people were, great, were, were generous to us. And you come and destroy their boat. What is this? <laughs> He immediately says to him, قَالَ أَلَمْ أَقُلْ إِنَّكَ لَن تَسْتَطِيعَ مَعَيَا صَبْرَ Didn't I say you will not be able to handle and be patient with me? Musa Sam then remembered immediately, he says, قَالَ لَا تُؤَخِذْنِي بِمَا نَسِيت Please don't hold me accountable for what I forgot. وَلَا تُرْهِقْنِي مِنْ أَمْرِ عُسْرَ And please don't do my head in. Don't keep talking to me and give me a lecture about it. I, I, I learned my lesson. Just let me go. خلص. Nothing else. The man stayed quiet. They went. Afterwards, they travel, and then they reached uh, a young boy, probably nine or ten years old. Young boy walking across. The man goes up to the young boy, hello, how are you? And then he kills him. Immediately kills him. Musa alayhi salam couldn't hold himself. This is even worse than a boat issue. 
قال أقتلت نفسا بغير نفس لقد جدت شيئا نكرا You've just killed an innocent soul when it hasn't killed any, it hasn't done anything. You have done something that is totally unacceptable, outrageous, immoral. Then he says, Alam aqul laka innaka lan tastati'a ma'aya sabra. The man adds one more word, but it's harsh and very short. He said to him, Did I not tell you before? To you, so it's getting a bit harsh, like lekka, to you, that you will not be able to be patient. Musa Salam then remembers, he says, قَالَ إِنْ سَأَلْتُكَ عَنْ شَيْءٍ بَعْدَهَا فَلَا تُصَاحِبْنِي He says, listen, if I ask you one more question, you have a right to kick me out. <laughs> he knew what he had done. قَدْ بَلَغْتَ مِنْ لَدُنِّي عُذْرًا I don't have any more excuses, you're right. So then they entered a land, a town, that town, they were very harsh to them. They didn't give them any food. They didn't give them any shelter. And we know the wayfarers, you're supposed to look after them. And these people were extremely rude, obnoxious to them. And they insulted them, kicked them out. As they were walking out and getting kicked out of the town, the man, Al-Khadr, saw a wall from a building that the people were trying to rebuild. But they were struggling with it. It was about to fall. So he goes and starts helping them. Now Musa looks at it, السلام, and he says, so he helps him. And after they finished, he says to him very quietly, so if, if you wanted to, at least you could have taken some money for what he helped them with. <laughs> I mean, they were harsh to us. Just take, nothing wrong with taking some money and help us. He goes, هذا فراق بيني وبينك. He says, that's it. No more companionship between us. <laughs> That's it, you've got no more excuses, you couldn't be patient, off you go. You're not a good student. That's in other words, Yani. He didn't say that, but he says, you're, you don't, you're, not, you're not able to handle stuff like this, Moses. Musa, he says, but look, before you go, I will tell you the meanings of all these three, so that you will learn. La ilaha illallah. As Allah says, Every person who's knowledgeable, there's someone even more knowledgeable, and Allah is the most knowledgeable. He says to him, as for the boat or the ship that we embarked, as you can see, they were poor people, they were good people. And their route, the route that they go on, they have to go past a particular town. They've got no other choice. And on, in that town, there currently has now become a king. There is a king on that route who is oppressive. He is taking every good-looking ship and good-looking boat. He takes it off its owners and doesn't pay them anything. And as you can see, they were already doing it hard. Had he taken their boat, they would have been homeless on the street and died of hunger or something like that. So I wanted to make their boat look like it's ruined. Just something light, so that the king leaves their boat alone when he sees it, and they continue to go on their route, and they don't have to, you know, uh, stop getting their provision. He said, as for the second issue with the boy, he said, their parents, his parents were righteous mothers and, it was a, he had a righteous mother and father. And yes, that boy didn't do anything. However, he was going to grow up to become a tyrant of disbelief over his parents. And he was going to cause them oppression and a heartache and badness and evil. Allah wanted to take this boy now at a young age and replace him with a better child for them. In other words, the child who died, Allah willed to forgive him. He knows. And the child that is going to give them is going to be righteous. And the parents will live a good life. All of them in the end will enter paradise. That's why. And as for the wall and the building and those people who treated us harshly, he said to him, that wall belonged to two orphans and they had nobody to protect them and defend them. And underneath that wall, underneath, there was a treasure left behind for them. They will inherit it. And they had a great, 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 great grandfather. I'm just talking the tafsir. Their great, 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 great grandfather was a righteous man. Because of him, Allah wanted to look after these Seventh generation. 
which shows that if you're righteous, brothers and sisters, Allah looks after your generations, even seven down, down the road. And you could see how the people were harsh. Had they seen the treasure, they would have taken the treasure from these orphans and nobody would defend them and they'll be out homeless on the street. So I wanted to build it and keep it a secret so that the boys can grow up and when they grow strong enough to claim their treasure, nobody will be in their way. And then he added one more thing. وَمَا فَعَلْتُهُ عَنْ أَمْرِي And all of these three that you saw me doing, I did not do them out of my own judgment. I did them out of Allah's order. So you don't go off, brothers and sisters, and doing things like that. But Allah wanted to teach us a lesson. What is that lesson? When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't give you what you want exactly, when something happens out of your expectation, when things don't go exactly as you had asked or as you had expected, brothers and sisters, whether you made istikhara, for example, and then you thought that things didn't go your way, or even if they went your way, it's not necessarily good or bad for you. Allah only knows. You have to continue to trust in Allah and rely on Him. Whether good or bad is the outcome. Because in our eyes, we may see something bad as a ba an outcome as bad when Allah knows it's good for you, just be patient. And sometimes we may see something as good for us when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows that it may not be the best for you. So sometimes you may lose in order to gain. Sometimes you may get sick to get healthier. Sometimes you may lose to get rewarded. Sometimes you go through strife in order for some other plan to come out. Wallahu ya'lamu wa antum la ta'lamun. Allah knows and you do not know. So this lesson today was about trust and tawakkul on Allah. And through knowing his true knowledge and his wisdom, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us understanding. Hada wa sallallahu ala nabina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.